let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Beloved in the Lord, I greet you all in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a joy to be here this morning to greet you all when we observe the Reformation Sunday and preach the word of God to you. God has again given me the privilege to share the word of God from this pulpit of Egmore Wesley Church. And this Sunday, as I told, is being observed as Reformation Sunday all over the world in the Protestant Christendom. The reason is, it was on October 31st that Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the notice board of the, on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg in Germany. And then on that day, the seed of reformation was sown on 31st October, on 31st October of 1517. And today, the Sunday nearer to October 31st is being observed as Reformation Sunday all over the world in the Protestant churches. And the history is that Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest, actually a monk. And, but when the Roman Catholic Church, because of the Pope's order, announced about the indulgence, that is purchase of tickets for forgiveness of sins, was announced by the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther, though he was a monk and priest under the Archbishop's authority and Pope's authority, openly resisted. And at that time, he was a priest at the Wittenberg, the castle church, the castle church in Wittenberg, you can see it on the board. The castle, that is the castle church in Wittenberg. And Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the cross on the door of the Wittenberg church on 1517, October 31st. And you would be surprised to hear that I had the privilege of preaching from the pulpit of that Wittenberg Castle Church where Martin Luther stood and preached. What a great privilege for me. In the year 2012, I was invited to take part in the International Homileticians Conference. Homiletics is the art of preaching, science of preaching. Homiletics means. I have specialized in that and did my doctoral studies and got my doctorate. And I was invited as one of the preachers to preach from the pulpit of that castle church in Wittenberg in 2012. It was very shivering experience for me to stand in the same pulpit. I was trembling. Lord, I am not worthy to preach from this pulpit of Martin Luther where Martin Luther preached and started the Reformation. But God had given me that privilege, upheld me with his grace and took me to Wittenberg. I was the preacher from that church in the International Conference of the Homileticians where people from about 20 countries gathered. And when he nailed 95 theses, he was drawn to the court of the church, Roman Catholic Church, and was questioned how he can do that, raising his voice against the indulgence, the practice of indulgence. What is indulgence? Purchase, you must purchase tickets for the forgiveness of sins. If you purchase ticket for 500 rupees, five, five of your sins will be forgiven. 
thousand rupees, ten of your sins will be forgiven. Then two thousand twenty sins will be forgiven. If you are rich, you can buy for fifty thousand and commit any number of sins, and it will be forgiven and absolved, pardon and absolved. So purchase of tickets for forgiveness, obtaining forgiveness. So forgiveness doesn't come from directly from God to you. You have to purchase tickets. And therefore, Martin Luther took a stand and he was questioned. He said, "Here I stand. Lord, help me. I can do no other. Here I stand. Lord, help me. I can do no other." That's what he said when he was in his defence, because. The verse that motivated him was at that time, as found in Romans chapter one, verses sixteen and seventeen. Paul's epistle to Romans chapter one, verses sixteen and seventeen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Gospel is salvation for everyone who believes. You cannot sell salvation, purchase salvation by your contribution, by your donation. and because you are a wealthy fellow you can purchase any number of tickets and commit any number of sins what is this that is against the doctrine of the bible that is against the truth inscribed in the word of god and he raised his voice so boldly and openly and then in verse 17 the righteous shall live by faith alone the righteous one who is to be declared as righteous by faith alone and not by any human words this is the stand that martin luther took and is the reformation that started on 31st of october 1517 significantly affected the moral political climate of whole of europe and it started spreading to other countries in europe like Spain, then Switzerland, then France, and other countries through various people of God who were raised at that time, like John Calvin, John Huss, and Thomas Cranmer in Britain, and in several place countries, and then it came to India also. And therefore, today we have the Protestant Church. It is because of what God has done through Martin Luther, one man, because. though the whole church of roman catholic church the church there was only one church and that is roman catholic church the whole church was against martin luther but martin luther said here i stand lord help me that's what i can do i can do no other what a boldness that god had given him on that day courage to take a stand one man with god is a majority always remember one man with god is a majority today we are all protestants john wesley got converted as a protestant and started his mission and today we have the methodist church or the wesley church in which we were under the roof of this wesley church we are worshiping it is because of martin luther remember so we have forgotten the younger generation are not aware of these facts of martin luther's reformation and five slogans he taught the church at that time he gave five slogans for the church number 1 faith alone number 2 scripture alone faith alone scripture alone then grace alone number 4 christ alone number 5 to the glory of god alone let me repeat what i have said the five slogans of martin luther faith alone scripture alone grace alone christ alone and to the glory of god alone and he was the one all you lay people must be thankful to god for martin luther because in addition to these five slogans he was the one who insisted on the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers how many of us are aware of that priesthood of all believers the roman catholic church said at that time no 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 priesthood belongs only to the ordained priests and the consecrated bishops or archbishops 
and to the pope others are not at all priests but martin luther said no the scripture says priesthood of all believers all those who believe in christ are believers and what is the scripture how to substantiate it the scriptural evidence for it is found in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 first peter chapter 2 verse 9 where it says to the believers peter was writing but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for his god's people for his own possession whose possession god's possession and that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so you are a chosen race and a royal priesthood all the believers in christ are a chosen or chosen people and royal priest this is what martin luther said according to the scriptural teaching and therefore the bible was only in the hands of the priest and the bishops only they have the right to interpret they have the right to handle the bi- bi- word of god that is the bible and bible was not sold was not available to anybody else think of those circumstances bible was not available to the people of god who are sitting in the pews they must simply listen to what the priest says and they said tradition as more as more authority than the word of god tradition the catholic church's tradition has more authority than the word of god therefore they gave more importance to the tradition of the churches than the word of god than the scripture and therefore martin luther had to raise his voice and then spread the reformation and to england through thomas cranmer and then john wesley all these people followed the footsteps of martin luther and today we are here in the wesley church what are the marks of the reformed church today the topic is given as reform to reform reformed and reforming church we have been reformed in order to reform first please turn with me to the passage that was read to us instead of the epistle portion acts chapter 2 verse 42 acts chapter 2 verse 42 was read to us from 42 to 47 and the early christians from the day of pentecost they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching first the early christians devoted themselves to the apostles preaching that is the learning church it was a learning church there was teaching and therefore the people gathered in the church to learn learning church and it is one of the marks of the reformed church we must give importance to the word of god and john wesley gave importance to the word of god even martin luther gave importance to the word of god and they said see the pulpit must be higher than the altar the pulpit must be higher than the altar why because the word of god must be given prominence priority so it must be higher not the altar and that is why we have the pulpit higher than the altar here in also at egmore wesley church and the word of god gives substance to our faith and it is given in order to grow in enable us to grow as first peter chapter 2 verse 2 let me read to you first peter chapter 2 verse 2 like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation you may grow up into salvation so it not only provides substance for our faith it enables us to grow it stabilizes us in times of trials and tribulations the word of god strengthens you and stabilizes you and me in times of trials and tribulations and it enables you and me to equip you and me to successfully handle the problems of life how many of us are unable to 
tackle the problems of life it is because we don't give importance to the word of god we don't read it regularly we don't allow god to speak to us through the written word of the scripture and it enables you and me to successfully handle the problems of life and it also equips you and me to fight against uh, like martin luther to fight against the false teaching several wrong doctrines that are being spread the prosperity doctrine if you believe in christ you will become rich and richer and richer and richer is that the teaching of christ then who was the most righteous person lived on the earth jesus christ did he become rich monetarily economically no not at all the most righteous person on the earth was jesus christ and he never became rich and richer and richer no not at all therefore it is a wrong teaching prosperity doctrine so it equips you and me to fight against such kind of false wrong doctrines of the church and also correct errors and it calms our fears it calms our the word of god calms our fears and our also erases our superstitious beliefs sometimes we are also superstitiously believing something so it erases our superstitious beliefs so learning church mark of a reformed church secondly it was a worshiping church again our key passage is acts chapter 2 the passage that was read to us it was worship was not half hearted effort it was intense whole hearted effort loving god with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul and with all your strength it is worshiping god with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul and with all your strength it is not half hearted how do you know there was prayer the same verse 42 to the breaking of the bread and the prayers to the breaking of the bread and prayers so there was prayer as well as breaking of the bread and where did they meet again in the same passage verse 46 and day by day attending the temple together attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts okay so there was worship in the temple it was a formal worship formal worship structural worship order of service following the order and also worshiping at homes so that is why we meet in homes in houses area fellowships when i was a pastor of redeemer church ananagar i introduced the zonal fellowship i divided the congregation into 12 zones according to the geographical location 12 zones and the 12 tribes names were given to the 12 zones 12 tribes so well at least twice in a month they should meet by themselves those living in that zone and meet together for sharing for helping one another it for caring one another and praying together and reading the word of god together and 12 zonal leaders and assistant zonal leaders were appointed for all the 12 zones so that they could meet regularly the pastor may visit once in 3 months because all the 12 zones he cannot be visiting on the whole month therefore the pastor will visit once in 2 or 3 months but they should meet and worship together so it was an informal worship formal worship in the temple and informal worship at homes in the zonal fellowship or family fellowship or house worship and the worship was also we find joyful and fervent how do you know joyful in the same 46 verse with glad and generous hearts praising god and having favor with all the people praising god we have faced we had praise and worship in the service thank god for that and you know we must praise god there must it must be a joyful worship 
giving thanks to God for what God has done in our lives so far. And it was also a fervent worship. It was also a fervent worship. How do you know verse 43? And fear came upon every soul and many wonders. Fear came upon every soul. It was a fervent worship, joyful worship. There was simplicity in worship. There was simplicity in worship. And, and what is real worship of a transformed church or re reformed church? Again, let me quote from Ro Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. What do we find there? Offer your body, my brother, brothers and sisters, I beseech you by the mercies of God to offer your bodies. I appeal to you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, meaningful worship. So, that is the meaningful worship. That is the reasonable service. Beloved, if you are members of Reformed Church, let us offer ourselves, New English Bible translates it as, offer yourselves, offer your very selves. It is not merely the bodies, it is offering your mind, your soul, your spirit, everything to God. Surrender everything, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. That must be meaningful worship. So we must have a correct understanding of worship, be, realizing that it is both personal, offer your bodies, your bodies, your bodies, offer yourself, 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 personal and corporate, coming together and worshipping together. Because if you want to remain alone, someone, saintly person said, if you want to remain alone, you cannot do two things. Number one, you cannot get married if you want to remain alone and you cannot be a Christian. You must come together and participate in the corporate worship because worship has a moral content. Again, let me refer to Psalm 26. Psalm 26, where the psalmist says, what is worship? First, verse 6. He says, I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. Psalm 26, verse 6. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O God. We have come here to be washed, cleansed by the blood. And that is why two Sundays and on the first of the every, every month and one Sunday evening, every month we have Holy Communion service, receiving the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, realizing our unworthiness and offering ourselves to be washed by the blood of the Lord. So worship has a moral content. And worship must be motivated by love. Verse 8. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I worship, O Lord, verse same chapter, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. And then again in verse 7, it says, worship is also a witness. Witness to others. Let me read to you. Proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Proclaiming. It is witness. Worship is a witness. You read Psalm 26 when you go back to your homes. It talks about the worship. The significance of worship. And then comes the it was a loving and caring church of fellowship. Fellowship, koinonia. In the same Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to apostle teaching. That is instruction by the apostles or the word of God, teaching of the word of God and the fellowship. They were together like a cluster of grapes. They were together like a cluster of grapes. Not like, not like a marbles. They were not a bunch of isolated marbles. Marbles, when you are put in a box, though they are side by side, 
seems to be very closely knitted together. When you just throw it, what happens? It gets scattered in different directions. It's not a cluster. Whereas grapes remain together and individual marbles, isolated marbles. Sometimes we Christians have become like isolated marbles. Immediately after the service we disappear. Why? We don't want to mingle with others. We are marvelous. Therefore we cannot have fellowship relationship relate with each other. That is why we are in coffee fellowship. Why? In order to enable people to meet after the service, greet each other, inquire about each other, about their welfare, about their family members and take note of those who are absent today and call them and tell them why you are absent, what happened, why you have not come to the church, inquire about them. But if we behave like isolated marbles and get scattered in different directions, it is not a reform, reformed church, mark of a reformed church. Remember that. So we must enjoy fellowship after having come to the church. And also, there was sharing. It was a sharing and caring church. How do you know? Loving church, sharing and caring church. Because, this, again, the same portion we find in Acts chapter 2, they all shared together everything in common. They all shared together everything in common. What is meant by that? They were, and verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and dispute, distributing the pro, proceeds, to, proceeds to all as they had need. Underline that word, need. Again, in chapter 4, also, we find that chapter 4, beginning at the 34th verse. I'm sorry. <laughs> what happened? When the early church, they started sharing everything, they sold everything that they had and brought to the apostles in order to be shared. There was not a needy person among them. Chapter 4, verse 34. As many as were owners of lands and ho or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds, proceeds to of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. It was distributed according to their needs and not according to their greed. It was distributed according to their need and not according to their greed. Isn't that something amazing? How, when are we going to follow such an example? No church on the earth can claim to have followed such thing. Isn't it? It was done in the apostolic period and the church must move forward in order to meet each person's need and not fulfill each person's greed. And then finally, it was a reaching out church that is evangelizing, reaching out or evangelizing church. Again, verse 47 of chapter 2. Praising, and the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. And the Lord added to the church, the number of the church, day by day to those who were being added to the church. The quality of the fellowship in the church attracted the people from outside. How these people are able to mingle together, born in, two, born in various different places and brought up in various atmospheres, educated, uneducated, literate or illiterate, rich or poor. When they meet together in the church, they have such a joyful fellowship and that fellowship attracted people from outside. And therefore, the Lord was adding the gospel was taken to the street and the people on the street began coming to the church within the four walls of the church. Those who are, I used to say very often, 
why do we participate in the worship service sunday after sunday to get our batteries recharged to get our spiritual batteries recharged so that we can go out and be powerful witnesses and so that people can start others can start coming inside the church within the four walls of the church and join worshiping it was a reaching out church evangelizing church and that is what is needed i'm glad that various projects are being taken up last tuesday i had been to tirukal kundram um, for a church a foundation stone laying constructing a village church and today men solution members and a few others along with the pastor had gone to satyavedu for outreach program and medical outreach ca- medical camps will be conducted soon in response to the uh, bishop request i was told bishop in charge bishop sharma nityanandam and therefore we must become a church that reaches out to others donald mcgovern how many of you have heard of him of his name donald mcgovern who started church growth mission do you know where his office was you will be surprised to know that the office was just opposite he came from usa from pasadena Cali- pasadena in california from from fuller theological seminary and started his office here next behind ho- at that time it was hotel dasa prakash dasa prakash behind hotel dasa prakash in that small street he started his office and did research of church growth in india and therefore he started the mission called church growth mission in india and his research, after his research he said there are churches in india are growing in three ways first of all it is biological growth why are we christians because my parents are christians why they were christians because my grandfather grandmother all they were christians and my forefathers were christians so we are christians by birth biological growth so this church may have biological growth let us thank god for it and then comes transfer growth many of us would have been born and brought up in different places but because of job opportunities provided in the city of chennai we came and started residing in and around the egmore wesley area and therefore we have started enrolling ourselves as members of this church and we have become members of the church by producing transfer certificate from the churches from where we have come where we were baptized or where we had taken confirmation so there is transfer growth we are not new converts transfer growth third growth is conversion growth conversion growth biological growth transfer growth and conversion growth but there are less number of converts in the churches because there is no effective conversion growth in city in the churches of south india this is donald mcgovern findings research findings and therefore we need more conversion growth so our outreach programs must bring non christians to taste the love of christ love of god revealed in jesus christ and they should start coming or attending the local churches Be- because the god the book of acts ends with unfinished agenda let me repeat the book of acts finish closes with unfinished agenda and the agenda has been passed on to the other churches and the, in the 21st century it is passed on to egmore wesley church so the church should become a reforming church not only reformed church but also reforming church the depth of the church is determined by the quality of its worship and the teaching of the word of god the depth of the church is determined by the any church by the quality of worship and by the teaching of the word of god whereas the breadth of the church is to be determined by its commitment to fellowship and evangelism the breadth of the church is determined by its commitment to fellowship and evangelism and the obedience to 
the great commandment of the Lord. The obedience to great commandment, great commandment. What is the great commandment? Love God and love your neighbor. Love God. This is the summary of all the prophets and the Old Testament law. Love God and love your neighbor. So, the obedience to the great commandment, love God and love your neighbor, and the commitment to the great commission, which is the great commission, go and preach gospel to the people of all nations, is the great commission. The commitment to the great commission will make the church, any church, great church. Obedience to great commandment and commitment to great commission will make the church a great church. May Egmore Wesley Church become a great church in the days to come. When we observe the Reformation Day, let us be reformed by the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit, the washing of, the, of our sins by the blood of the Lord. And let us leave this church as reformed men and women. Which is the church? You remember the song? The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. You and I are the church. And therefore, the church must be cleansed, purified means it is you and me. Let us leave this place as reformed men and women, reformed boys and girls, in order to reform others and bring them into the fold of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God motivate us, enable us to discharge our duties as a reformed Christians. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us through the written word of the scripture and through the spoken word of the message. We thank you, Lord, for enabling us to see ourselves as we really are. We 